and welcome to this very special presentation on how to develop an under eight player from beginner to county level. My name is Steve Whelan from my tennis coaching. Hopefully you've seen my videos before, whether on be on Facebook or YouTube. And yeah, welcome. It's Friday. The sun's out. Um, and let's get into it. So today's presentation, I have a couple of different learning outcomes. So we're going to look at and understand the challenges and opportunities at under eight tennis. It's quite a key stage of a player's development and a player pathway, but it does have its opportunities, but also has its challenges as well. So we're going to look at those. We're going to look at different coaching styles. So we're going to look at a direct coach approach and a constraint led approach. If you follow me on social media at my, at my tennis coaching, you will know that I'm quite heavy into constraint led coaching, game based type coaching. Um, that's not to say that I don't do some direct coaching as well, but we're going to look at the two different styles and approaches. And we're going to look at which I believe, in my opinion, is more effective at under eight level. And we're going to look at the basics of a constraint led approach. Because again, I don't think people fully understand what a constraint led approach is or game based approach is. Um, so we're going to look at the basics of it. And I'm, I'm going to show you some clips of me coaching a player uh, recently using the constraint-led approach or constraint-based approach. So that's the the idea. It's going to run about 90 minutes. We are on YouTube Live. There was a lot of demand for this webinar. Um, it was going to be a closed webinar on my website, but I was just a little bit wary of the amount of people who were interested in it. And because I'm streaming videos and there's lots of coaches around the world, I've decided to stream it on YouTube Live. But please do feel free to leave any questions or comments um, in the chat. I'll try and answer them as we go through. I do have someone moderating it for me as well. Uh, so they may sort of ping back and answer. If I don't get through to you on the live stream, <clears throat> pardon me, what I'll do is I will record a, a separate video this week and get that out to you as well, answering your questions. Um, so I still want to be interactive as possible um just i've never done such a big stream to so many people before i just didn't want to do it and uh, we had some performance issues so in terms of who i am if you don't know who i am steve wheeling i am an lta performance coach here in the uk and i'm also a coach educator so you probably just see me there dead center in that photo on the right hand side um so i coach players but i also coach coaches and that was taken recently on an lta coach forum for those of you who don't know who the LTA are, it's the governing body here in the UK, the Lawn Tennis Association. So I go around and I do the coach qualifications and coach continuous professional development workshops. And that's what my day-to-day -day job. Been coaching for 22 years. I've worked in big commercial centres, high-performance centres, small parks, small clubs, big clubs, schools, you name it. I've probably coached in it and coached that standard as well. Um, I've been very fortunate to work in the under eight workspace for a number of years. And a lot of my players I've taken from complete beginners and they've gone to national level and then they've gone past me uh, and gone into sort of international tennis as well. Um, and that all started off in their journey with me. I never take credit for players development. It's always down to the player. Uh, but I've been fortunate enough, fortunate enough to work with some good players at the red level who have gone on to sort of grand slam uh, and international tennis, not saying that's down to me, uh, but I do have a good reference point from where they sort of started out. So we're going to look at under eight tennis in, in great detail, saying to me, it's the most important stage because if we get this wrong, we're always sort of firefighting and fixing things. If we get this wrong at under eight, when they go to under nine, they're going to struggle. When they go to under 10, they're going to struggle more and they're probably going to give up. Tennis is such a hard game. Um, and the great thing about mini tennis or tennis tens or LTA youth is we now have lots of modified equipment. So you can see that in the picture, again, a, a very recent coach education workshop. We've got smaller nets, we've got slower tennis balls, we've got smaller tennis rackets. So we, this, this is so great for our sport now because we can really constrain, which is a word I use quite a lot today, the environment to help the players develop. And it, it is a really important stage, but we need to understand the stage. We need to understand the player of the stage. And again, I'm quite fortunate in my role. Uh, the picture there was taken on a recent LCA regional camp or state camp if you're in the, in the state. So 
six of the best under eight players get together every quarter uh, and we train them. And I was one of the coaches on on the east of England uh, camps and one of my players were in that picture. Um, so I'm quite lucky because I'm in this workspace. I'm working with some good players in this workspace. Um, so it's very important before we even talk about drills and how we make the players better that we actually understand what's in front of us. I think sometimes with with tennis coaching, especially we we look at the top players and we try and get our little nine year olds or eight year olds to play like Nadal, to play like Raducanu. It's completely unrealistic. Uh, we have to work our work with what's in front of us. And so the first part of this presentation is to really have a little look at the player and the sort of stage and understand what what I call the, the man to the game. So under eight tennis, mini red, red youth tennis, wh uh, whatever you call it in your country, does have different challenges and opportunities. The first big challenge is the real limited physical development of the player. So these players might come in red at four and they're with you for three, four years until about eight. An eight-year-old physically can't do what a nine-year-old can do. An eight-year-old definitely can't do what a 10-year-old can do. And an eight-year-old can't do what a 19-year-old professional player can do. So you've got to understand that their physical movement is going to be very limited. Like They're not going to be very coordinated. They're not going to be very good at throwing and catching, sending and receiving. They're not going to be very quick. The reaction skills are going to be quite limited and quite slow. That's a challenge because tennis is a very open game. If you ever watched any of my webinars before, especially the last couple on ta uh, tactics and technique, we talk. I talk about this quite a lot. Tennis is a tough game. You've generally got one and a half seconds to send the ball and the ball comes back. You've got to be able to coordinate your body, move around the court, send an object back, also linking tactics and technique. And it's tough physically. There's a reason why the best tennis players in the world now are some of the best athletes in the world because of the physical demands of the game. And it's something that we need to bear in mind because sometimes we we try and teach very complicated movements to very inexperienced and very raw players. And they can't perform the actions that we find very easy. They can't perform the actions that maybe a nine-year-old can, uh, can perform. You may have two seven-year-olds who are physically different one will be able to perform the action, one won't. So you've got to really think about, we are at the very early stages of their physical development, but saying that, it is the ideal window of opportunity to develop those physical skills as well. But they are limited. They're also very limited in their mental development. So when we ask our kids to concentrate, you've got to understand how difficult concentration is for a kid. I'm 39, I'm 40 in a few weeks, uh, sort of in sort of at the time of recording this video. I don't listen. You talk to me, I'll nod. I'm not listening. I'm so kinesthetic. Kinesthetic is I learn by feel. I have to do something. So when someone's explaining to me, if they're just talking to me, I've switched off. I'm not even listening to you. And it's not that I'm being rude. It's just I don't process information that way. And kids, in my experience, and I'm pretty sure there's quite a lot of research on this, are very visual learners and kinesthetic. Very little or very, very few children learn verbally. They just can't process the information. So we've got to understand that. We've also got to understand that the kids at this stage, decision making is so limited. And again, I've seen coaches say, okay, hit the ball to the weakness and hit the ball flatter and quicker and take time and space away. And then the kid can't process all that. It's just too much. It's overload. And when I do coach education and I'm explaining this to, to, to coaches, I always say it's like, it's like different sizes of glass. Okay. So you've got a little shot glass. You've got a bigger glass and bigger glass. And as, as they get older, the glasses get bigger and glass right here. And as your coaching is the water or what you want to put in the glass. And with the little kids, you've got a very small shot glass. You can only put a little bit of information in there before it overloads. So they may take in that little bit of information and all the rest of the knowledge you're pouring on them is just wasted. So you've got your best quality vodka. You pour the shot and you keep pouring it and you're wasting all that vodka. And if you're Northern like me, you, you are like a stiff drink. So it's a waste. Um, as they get older, the, 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 the glasses get bigger and you can put more knowledge or, or vodka in there. But you have to understand that they are really limited in, in, in terms of the information they can take on, but also the information they can process.
they have limited time on court. So most beginners will come to you to start with just for 45 minutes a week in a group session. And that's a challenge because if I go to gym and I work out just for 45 minutes a week, will I see progress? Not really. And if you're a very much old school, old school, traditional coach who will line the players up and feed a ball, let's say that player hits, I don't know, 20 balls in a lesson. If I go to the gym and I do 20 reps on the bench press, am I going to see any progress? No, not really. It's going to take a long time for me to see progress. So we've got to make sure that we maximize that time on court. So if they do come to a group session for 45 minutes, they have to be playing tennis for 45 minutes. We we can't have them standing around and, and waiting in lines or standing around learning how to balance. We've got to maximize the amount of time the racket's in their hand and they play. I always argue if it's a 45-minute session, they should be playing for 35 minutes tennis. And that includes drinks, breaks, and, and stuff like that. You need to maximize your time on court. But it is a challenge. It is a challenge. And, and again, going back over my career, people say to me, oh, how come X player got to that level? X player got to that level, quite high county, regional, national level. They just played, they just played tennis. They spent more time on court. Um, some of my most successful players, you look at their programs, they're playing three, four times a week. It's not really rocket science. The more time you put in, the better you get. Uh, and obviously it goes down to sort of quality over quantity as well. That's not to say if you did 20 hours on court, you're going to be great. If you do 20 hours on court, it's bad quality. It's it's probably not going to be the same, but they do have limited time on court at this stage. And the coach's experience, I put a little, a little asterisk there because again, my experience, most of the, most of the red sessions, under eight sessions here in the UK, especially are delegated to the most inexperienced coach. So the new coaches who just come fresh from qualifications are given the reds because they're seeing it's the easier sessions. It's the easier sessions. And okay, you can take the reds. And I think back to 20 odd years ago when I started coaching, I was given the reds because I was inexperienced. But you look at it and and we'll look at some of the stuff today. It's, it's probably the harder stage because they can't play. They can't move well physically. They've got very physical, sorry, limited physical development. They're limited mentally. And this inexperienced coach with no experience, no knowledge or very limited knowledge is is tasked with getting these kids up to standard to play. And it, it's nuts. It's just crazy. And I think the best programs I've ever been a part of, part of is your best under eight coaches are the most experienced coaches. They should be your level fives in this country or, or level fours or coaches with 20 odd years experience because how we communicate and how we teach these kids at this level is key. When they get older, like I'm, I'm, I'm with an old group tonight, regional level, um, and it, it's easier. You just talk. You just talk a few things and you address the performer and you may give a few tactical or little technical snippets here and there, but it's that easy. You put me on court of mini reds, it's it's a lot more difficult because it's you're, you've got limited tools and frontier so you've got to really work a lot harder um and and that's a huge challenge and hopefully if you're watching this video you're working with under eight and hats off to you you've got the hardest job and it, it drives me mad when i go into clubs and i can see the new coaches get given the the reds and they're on the bottom court and the most experienced coaches up on the top court with the better players or older players and it's yeah it, it doesn't sit well with me but that's that's my opinion. But we have opportunities, though, at Red. We have an opportunity to develop a love for the game. Like, when they come into the stage, again, here in the UK, tennis is, is behind football or soccer. Most kids love football. They love it. They watch it. They they breathe it. They wear their football shirts. You ask any kid uh, about Wimbledon or Andy Murray, Emma Raducanu, they haven't got a clue. So we have an opportunity to to develop that passion, that love for tennis. And how are the players going to develop that love? They need to have fun. It has to be fun. It has to be fun. It has to be engaging. It has to be exciting. And that all comes down to our delivery as coaches. And, and we'll look at two different approaches today. Um, but the, the kids have to have fun. They have to enjoy it. They have to develop that love. If they come out at this stage at eight, nine years old and they don't love tennis, they're not going to stay very long. 
but they really come out with, you know, I absolutely love this. Yeah, it's tough. It's challenging, but I love the challenge. I love the fact that it's competitive. Then we hopefully will keep them in the game for longer. And I often get asked by coaches when I do courses, what's my greatest coaching achievement? And I always say, if my players are playing in 20 years, so I'm 22 now and that's why I've been coaching 22 years. And if my players are still playing when I first started them off, and there's quite a few that are, thankfully, then that's what's my greatest achievement. It's if they're playing 10, 15, 20, 30 years into the future, because that's that's my job. It's to, it's to keep them in the game. It's not to develop the best players in the world. It's not to develop the um, county, regional players, which I know is a bit contradictive because that's the idea of this presentation. But it's to... It, it's to keep them in the game. And the research shows if the kids are competitive and they play competition, then, then they'll stay in the game longer. Um, so we need to get them to, to a county level really as quickly as possible because, again, county level, it's not it, – it's the it's the first step here in the UK in the player pathway. It's not that hard to produce a county player, really. It's just about getting them to be able to play uh, and play the game. And sort of that's part of our job is to develop their love of the game. We've got to build strong foundation. So, yes, the players are limited in terms of the physical and mental uh, skills. But we've got to put down really strong foundations because if we don't put the, the right foundations down, as they go through the age groups, those foundations will start to crumble and then we'll lose them from the game. So we've got to build them the mental skills, the head skills, the heart. They have to love the game. But then we have to develop the physical skills and then the tennis skills as well, the the, the, the sort of tactics and technique. Um, if we get if we get those things wrong here at the start, then we're in trouble. And the great thing is, like like I mentioned at the start, we have modified equipment now. So under eight tennis, sponge ball, smaller court, lower net. Um, it's a lot easier to pick up and play. Going back to 30 plus years ago when I started playing tennis, there's a wooden racket, really dead tennis ball, massive court rallies are few and far between it, it it wasn't that much fun you probably spent more time walking and picking the ball up than you did hitting it now it's 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 a lot easier to for kids to play the game that they see on tv uh with with, with longer rallies and sort of serving and, and sort of returning so that's a great opportunity for us and it's a great opportunity for getting the parents involved as well and some some people don't like the parents involved because they think they're too pushy they only become pushy because they are lacking education or that they, they, they've not been educated. So this is a great opportunity to sort of to sort of teach the parents as well and, and get off on the right foot. And my most successful um, relationship with players has been always strong with parents and having good communication with parents, parents involved in, in a lot of the decision making, but also a lot of the, the on court stuff and the parents know exactly what we're working on and, and how to communicate because being a tennis coach and being a parent are two completely different things. Um, how you communicate, how you feel. Um, it's a lot more stressful coaching your own kids. If anyone's on this call who coach your own kids, you know that, one, they don't listen to you. Um, and two, it's a lot more stressful than coaching other people's kids. So it's, it's, it's also an opportunity to get off on the right foot with the parents as well. So what's the goal? So we've got this very important stage, eight and under tennis. We need some benchmarks. And I'm very wary of outcome goals because I think every player will have their own journey. So I always sort of put some loose things. Okay, By the end of the age group, if my players are able to do these couple of things, I'm happy. I'm really happy. So what are my goals for the end of the age group? What am I working towards? What are my sort of my benchmarks? We've mentioned it. They've got to love the game. They have to love the game. If they don't come out of under eight tennis with a love of the game, they're not going to last. And they've got to enjoy competition. Tennis is a competitive sport. It's a tough sport. Yeah, and, and kids want to win and they don't like to lose, but we need to teach them how to learn to lose and how to deal with losing. So a lot of the stuff that we'll, we'll cover a little bit in this presentation, but also probably in, in future videos is we've got to learn, we have to teach them how to learn to lose. We've got to let them problem solve and we've got to put them into very difficult, pressure situations because that's the game. Like 
if you play tennis now and you go on court with your friend, you're problem solving. When they hit the ball down the line, you've got a problem. What what are the solutions? How can you find your way out of that? If you get a short ball, you've got an opportunity. How can you deal with that situation? People watching you, pressure environment. Second serve, match point down, pressure environment. So we have to teach these players how to how to deal with pressure, but also how to bounce back with uh, with uh, resilience as well. And the player that I show you in the video today is is really difficult because he's so competitive and he wants to win every single point. And it was interesting because we did a session last night, which is which is not the one we filmed. And every time he made a mistake, he'd cramp up and his head would go down and his shoulders would come up. I said to him, what are you doing? He said, oh, I made a mistake. Okay, so what I want you to do is head up, bring your arms out. He said, why? I said, because when you scrunch your neck up and shoulders up, how does that feel? And he said, oh, it's tight and awkward. How's it feel when you put your arms out and your head up? He goes, oh, I feel free. Well, that's it. Like, it, it's just deal with it. Like, move on. Rather than feeling tight and awkward and embarrassed, because because you think about it, when you're embarrassed, what do you do? You try and hide your face. And he's making these mistakes and he's ducking his head and he's, and he's, he's almost embarrassed because he doesn't want to make the mistake. So it's almost allowing him to make the mistake. And I, and I say to him all the time, you're allowed to make mistakes. You're allowed to make mistakes. You probably, you, you're definitely going to make mistakes, but how you deal with that mistake. And last night was interesting because it worked. And every time he made a mistake, he threw his arms out and his chest went up and you could see the difference in his body language. But we have to teach him how to deal with that and sort of become resilient to it as well. They have to be good movers. So we talked about this before. Tennis players are athletes these days, especially the professional game. But even at sort of club level, you've got to be able to move around the court. So we have to make sure our players have good agility, good speed and balance. We have to teach the game. So they need to be able to play in the three main game situations. They have to be able to serve, return and play both back. At underrate level, very rare would a player go in and play at the net because of the speed of the ball and the skills themselves. Not to say you shouldn't do network in terms of volleys and smashes and stuff. I think you should introduce all five situations at this level, um, but they're the three main. Okay, They have to be able to serve. They've got to be able to get the serve back and they've got to be able to maintain the ball from the back of the court. In terms of what they can do tactically, Consistency, so can they be accurate? Can they hit with a good tempo? And can they increase their rally threshold? So can they keep the ball in play? So it's a bit more than just get the ball over and in. Okay, can you get the ball over and in, but can you be accurate? So can you get the ball in, um, hit the ball cross court, hit the ball down the line? Can you get the ball in, but at a good tempo? Or are you just tapping it and floating it? Um, and then if you can do all those things, can you do it more consistently? And the players have to be tactically able to control space. So can they move their opponent around? And a big thing that I see a lot of coaches get wrong with this age group is they'll teach their players to use strengths, which is a common sort of tactic intention. Problem is players don't know what the strengths are. And you say, oh, well, my, my, my player knows their strengths their forehand. They're probably just repeating what you've told them. You've told them their forehand's their strength or you've told them that the backhand is their opponent's weakness. But if you watch him in the match, how often do they actually use their forehand when they have opportunities to? How often do they really pick and attack the backhand? Very rarely. Because at this age, again, that mental limitation is just, just more to work themselves at this stage. They can't, they're not very aware of what's going on around them. They're not aware of their full environment. So they can't really problem solve in terms of, okay, this is the ball, there's my opponent. What am I going to do? They just can't process that much information. So just be careful in terms of the tactics. And the one we've missed out there is control time. Very difficult to control time uh, when you're eight years old, especially when you're playing with a sponge ball. So, so, so getting them to hit the ball at a quicker tempo is possible at, at sort of higher standards. Um, but control time, again, is quite challenging at this level. So for me, the main tactics is get the ball over and in, with accuracy, good tempo, and make sure you're increasing that threshold. And can you control space? And technically, it's so simple. Basic shapes and basic grips. So nothing too extreme. So no full Western grips. Um, maybe not even a full semi-Western grip at this age. It's maybe sort of Eastern Continental uh, on all sides, especially on serve. 
very basic shapes, just getting the racket behind the ball, pushing through the ball, finishing high. A big mistake I see a lot of coaches make at this age group is it's too it's too complex. You've got split step into a unit turn, into a hip and shoulder separation, big shapes, big take backs. And the player physically can't do all that stuff. They haven't got the dexterity or the coordination to separate different body segments. So it so it it's it's really, really tough. And it, it really frustrates me because I can see the coach getting frustrated with the player because they can't do this really complex tech, uh, technical movement. And I'm thinking it's 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 like it's 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 impossible. It's like trying to get me to do some kind of Russian dance while spinning a plate on my head. It's like it, it it's really really tough. And and grips again, just got to make sure that the grips aren't too extreme. Um, but I don't really play around with grips too much at this stage. It's just quite basic. So if I come out at, at under eight with with these things in place, and I'm quite happy. And that brings me on to our first sort of video. So. The player in the video is one of the players that was on the LTA regional card. It's a player who I work with once a week. Um, and he is just turned eight and he is playing on orange court. And this is this is the level that we're sort of working towards. So a player that has quite basic shapes. And in this drill, it's very similar to the drill you see later on. The player has to maintain the rally cross court, but then he can change direction as he as and as and when he wants. Um, so again, the play in, in, in the video, tactically very smart. Not a bad mover, quite quite strong and powerful. Not the quickest or most, most agile mover. So it's again similar with some, some work to do there. Um, but if we get our players in and around this level, and so the player is top second in his county. Uh, for his age group, and I said he's top six regionally. So not a bad player for eight years old. And this is the goal. This is what we're working towards. And that's where it comes down to us. So it's it's the role of the coach. So what's our job? How can we improve performance? And that's, my, that's our job. People say to me, oh, what do you do as a coach? And my answer is, well, my job is to improve performance. It's not to make performance plays. It's it's to improve performance. It's to make someone go from A to B, and B is definitely better than A. And that's our role as a coach. And there's different types of approaches, and we're, we're definitely going to look at two main ones now. We have what we call direct coaching. And let me put my sound on. So direct coaching. This is a great little video. This was in the 1930s, I believe. And this is what coaching used to look like. <laughs> Fat ball and fat hills. You must make your stroke standing sideways to the net, not facing whether you are playing forehand or back. That's better. Let's try it again. No, he's forgotten already. Don't point your toes at the net. Have your feet parallel with the baseline. And get right down to the low ball with your shoulder towards the net and the weight of the body behind your stroke. This is the first and all-important rule of tennis. And although it looked simple enough, and is simple enough in practice and without the ball, it's quite a different problem in actual play. Now bend those knees and keep your body weight forward. That's better. You can see the difference, can't you? So there we go. Um, I put on the, this is an old Instagram post, I think from maybe two years ago. Um, has coaching changed in 92 years? And a direct coach approach is where the coach goes in, they analyze the player, which the coach is doing in a video, and they tell the player what to do, how to improve technique. And it's interesting because the the voiceover guy goes, oh, it's so simple, apart from the balls in play. <laughs> it's so true because the guy the guy is sort of shaping up and he's he's doing quite good technique when the ball's not in play. And then you see the clip, the ball comes in and he's all over the place. 
Um, but that's that's what direct coaching is. It's it's when the coach analyzes the player and they, they go straight in and they say, no, you need to do this. You need to get your toes that way, sideways on, get below the height of the net, push your racket through. Coaching that you'll see up and down the country every single day. And this is 92 years ago. Um, so has coaching changed? I'm not too sure. Um, let's look at the pros and cons. So what are the pros of the direct approach? What are the pros of the coach going in, analyzing the player and telling the player, you need to change this. You need to be able to do X, Y, and Z to improve performance. So it keeps the player on task. So you can be quite specific, get lower, swing low to high, swing low to high, swing low to high, swing low to high. So you can be quite specific and you can just keep repeating the same thing over and over and over again. Um, so it keeps players focused and on task. It's very isolated. You can really zone in, zone down on something. It really does facilitate early stage learning. So when a player really learns, you can really isolate the skill. You can just zone in on that path of the racket, low to high, low to high, and you can just basket feed that ball over and over again. Um, and the player will develop the skill very quickly doing that. And that's why a lot of coaching still happens this way, because you'll see skill acquisition improve. Sorry, you'll, you'll, you'll see skill, skill acquisition uh, increase quite quick. And I think I mentioned this in a, in a recent video about the six challenges of coaches or coaching. One of the things we have to do is repeat business. We want people to keep coming back. And if if people improve in a very quick or for a very small uh, moment of time, they'll think they've got value for money and then they'll come back. So this is great. If you and there's a coach, sorry if you're listening, but who, who I used to work with, very direct. And when we had a, a, a talk about it and he, he he said to me, I want them to feel good. I want them to feel good so they come back. And I, and I get that. I get that 100% because a coach has to protect their income. Um, and a coach can set these drills up and get improvements quick and the player can grow in confidence very quickly. And the players provided with rules. So if the ball lands here, you're going to do X, Y, and Z. If the ball lands there, you can do Y. Um, so you set up the rules for the player. You almost give them a structure to everything. So it's not it's not a bad way of coaching. It's not a bad way of coaching, but it does have its drawbacks. The players will find it hard to actually go into a game situation where there's more variables in play. Tennis is an open game. You don't get the same ball twice. It can go higher, it can go lower, it can go quicker, it can go slower. Top spin, slice, deep, short. Players who spend too long in a direct coaching situation, they can't adapt. They can't because they're not trained to. And you could see in, in, in the in the 1930s clip, as soon as he was given a ball, he, he didn't adapt. Without the ball, he was great. He looked amazing, but he couldn't adapt to the bounce and the speed of the ball. His his reception skills weren't that great because he's probably just getting so many, so many um, closed shots. And think about all the lessons you've done. Hold my hands up. I've done this myself. If you've done a really closed lesson and a really closed practice for a period of time and the player's got it, you think, yes, you've got it. You've absolutely got it. And you open it up and you put it into a game situation and they forget it all the way and, and they forget it straight away. And the player gets really frustrated and they go, oh, you know what? I had it. I had it. I, I don't know what's going on. And then what do you do? You just give them more direct information. But the issue is the game is now open. You've gone from a closed situation to an open situation and it's, it's broken down very quickly. It's that adaption bit, which is tough. Players find it very difficult to adapt. And there's a great clip, which which I've not included in this presentation, uh, that I put on, I think, two two weeks ago. Um, if you look at the tactical development framework presentation um, about, about Djokovic, and he hits five or six forehands. Every single forehand looked different. He adapts and he adjusts his, his, his technique, his movement, 
to 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 the ball he's given. Players who learn in a very isolated, direct manner, they can't adapt. They have very poor tactical understanding because they're so rich, they're they're so regimented. They're provided with rules and structure. They can't really think for themselves, so they they will literally just follow patterns of of, of drills. Um, and there's a great clip I've seen today of, of of a young girl, and you could see she's been overcoached because every single shot she hit cross court, she never changed direction once. And you could look at it and think, oh, this kid's really good. But I was looking at going, oh, this kid's been overcoached. She can't change direction. Tactically, that's going to be an issue. Like she can't change direction. She's going to be so easy to read. You know exactly where the ball's going. And from a tennis skill point of view, she can't change. So you look at it and think, oh, this girl's really good. She's top. But no, tactically, she's lacking. She she can't change direction in the ball. So they have really poor technical understanding. Again, just lots of drills. Okay, cross court, cross court, cross court, cross court. Short ball line. And it, 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 just tactically, they 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 almost go on autopilot and just go back into those those drill patterns. And the improvements will plateau out. And there's a great, I can't remember who it was. I can't remember who it was. There was a great presentation I watched last week. Um, and I actually think it was a skill acquisition uh video. And the guy put on on the um on the screen, it's like maps. So I've got a board here. So what is two times two times two times sorry twelve times eleven? So what's so what's twelve times eleven? 132. What's 12 times 11? 132. 12 times 11. 132. 12 times 11. 132. So the first time I did it, I had to look and get the answer off the board next to me here. Okay. 12 times 11. 132. I repeated it a few times. Bang. Automatic. I'm not learning no more. So if I'm hitting the forehand, once I get it three or four times, I'm not learning now. I've stopped learning. So my learning plateaus very quickly. So yes, I might make quick improvements. 12 times 11, 132. 12 times 13, uh, 144. No, 12 times 12, 144. So I have to, so I need different questions thrown at me to keep my learning. And I just thought that was a great example of, yes, when you first learn something, it's slow and awkward. Repeat it a few times and then learning stops. It plateaus out. So what is a constraint-based approach? So a little bit different type of coaching. This was filmed last year, I think, um, at county training with my girls on the 12 team. Um, and what I've done is they're working on their volleys here. And what was happening, a big thing was they were all swinging. They were all swinging and taking huge swings at the volley. So... I set them up with a little exercise where they're not allowed to bring the racket across the net. So I've constrained the drill. And if we watch it again, they don't take their racket across the net. And I think I will show this in a future video of, of how I built up to this and show you the, the, the problem of the girl swinging and then how I isolated it. And then when I brought it back into a game situation, the volleys were so much sharper. So I've constrained the activity. But what does it mean to be a constraint-led coach? What are the pros and cons of doing it this way? Players will play the game or, or modified versions. Players develop better problem-solving skills. So with that clip I just showed you, I put the players over the net. Is it realistic? No. Are they allowed to do that in a match? No. But I'm developing skill. I'm developing skill. I've put them in a situation where they can see and feel something, which is quite important, which we'll talk about quite a lot today. And uh, what I mean, they're just blocking the ball back. So they're, t they're learning how to keep the racket in front of them and not take the racket back and swing. I've given them a problem. And, and when I set them up, it was a case of, okay, you're going to go in this position. The racket's not allowed to come on this side of net play. That's the problem. So I, I showed them a problem. They had to solve it themselves. And they developed the skills as they went along. Practice will be varied. 
and and players will develop more versatile t- their skills. So it's not closed. There's more there's more variables. Higher ball, lower ball. It's a bit more open. It's a bit more crazy. Different things happen. Implicit learning. So the player will learn, and they're constantly learning because they're constantly adapting. Because even in that little drill there, the player might get a ball straight out of the body. They may get a ball higher. Make a ball on that side. So they're constantly learning to adapt and change. It's not just hitting the perfect volley eight times in a row. Yeah, she's constantly having to adapt and adjust. Um, and that's and that's making her learning constant. And research shows if you if you go into Google after this presentation and just Google constraint-based coaching, constraint-led coaching research, there's so many papers out there. And it shows that the players who learn in this type of activity develop and play better under stress. People talk about Barcelona Football Club a lot, uh, especially when in the glory is not so much these days. We've got no money, and they, they, they were so, they, they were seen as a very technical team, technical, amazing players. Technique was unbelievable. If you actually look at how they trained. They didn't do any technical coaching, none. So at the not the Mestai, I can't remember the name of the of the Barcelona Academy. But at the Barcelona Academy, what what did they do? They constrained practice three versus three, three versus two, five versus three, where the three have to keep the ball. They developed technique in pressured situations, and the players had to adapt and adjust based on a scenario. That made them very good technically. Because they have to find the solution to the problem they presented. Three forwards or three defenders against five pressing forwards. We've got to keep the ball. And that's why they were unbelievable for years. They could literally pass the way out of anything. Little triangles and pass the ball around. Because they just did it in training. And they didn't spend hours, okay, get your foot in this position to control the ball. Over the heel, get the toes facing that way to send the ball. That None of that stuff. It was all constraint-based coaching. But what are the cons? It could take time. It could take time. And this goes into the individual. And we are going to look at this in more detail as we go through this presentation. It can take time. So that instant success that direct coaching presents might not happen with with constraint-based coaching. It could take minutes, hours, weeks, months to really develop the skill but the question I'd throw at tennis coaches watching this presentation, are we in this for the short term or the long term? Hopefully your answer is the long term. That's all we ever say that takes the parents. Oh, it's all about the long term player development. It's about playing well in 10 years. If that's the case, then we should be teaching that way. We shouldn't be in this mad rush to get all these things in place um, very quickly. We should allow them to develop the skills over time. It looks messy and disorientated. There's no structure. There's no regiment. And people look at my group sessions sometimes and they think, oh, well, it's just chaotic. It's nuts. Like there's so much. Why has he got one racket between two players? Why is he hitting the ball over a, t- a washing line or a tape? Why, why is he doing these mad games? Like that looks nothing like tennis. It's chaotic. When you play a match, it's chaotic. It, the ball high, low, quick, slow, fast. Top spin, slice, like it's nuts. A tennis match is messy. Short rallies. It, it, tennis is chaotic. And I think sometimes as coaches, we we worry about the chaos because again, our, our thought goes onto the balcony or, 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 or to the court side and the parents watching. We think, oh, it looks a mess. They're not going to come back. But then you also look at, at kids. Do kids like regimented stuff or do they like messy and craziness and fun and lots of activity? They want the chaos. They don't want to be stood there and told how to hit this perfect shot. They want to get involved and explore it themselves. The kinesthetic learner will want to come out. You only have to go to a playground and the kids, like it's it's chaos. Go to lunchtime at a school. It's nuts. It's chaos. So these kids are playing lots of these different games and using their imagination. They're not all sitting there regimented and talking through how to how to do something. It, it, it It's nuts. So don't worry about that. But I understand the peer pressure of it looking messy and chaotic. But that's where you have to work with the parents. Like I said before, it's opportunity to get, to get off a good foot with the parents. Sometimes we can constrain it. We can put rules and stuff in place or we set activities up 
if they're too easy or too difficult for the player, then they can become disengaged. Um, and it's always that fine balance of, of looking at what's in front of you. Okay, how can I manipulate something to get the result that I want without damaging the player's confidence, but also keeping them focused as well? So which is best? The truth, it's a mixture of both. Yeah, it's a mixture of both. I think with some players, you may have to be a bit more direct. Some players might want you to be a bit more direct. In my experience, especially with the under 10s and definitely the under 8s, a constraint-based approach is best just because kids don't listen. They really don't listen. And to be honest, they don't want to listen. Most of them don't want. Some might, again, individual learning style. Uh, you sort of have to work that out yourself. But 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 they want to learn and explore. You only have to go into a preschool or go into a primary school and look at and look at their school activities. It's all about exploring and trying things and trial and error. And and, and that's that's for me the key to under eight tennis. It's it's giving them the opportunity to explore themselves and express themselves and find their own way. As they get older, you can be a bit more direct. Yeah, and I I always say that my constraint, uh, my constraint led approach is me, um, pushing the player towards the answer. Sometimes when I go direct, I've got to pull them, and it's that constant push pull. But I'm pushing more than I'm pulling at this age. As they get older, it might be a bit more direct. I can give one of the one of the county regional players tonight a little bit more direct information and I'll process it quick. Yeah, got it. I I give it to my young under eight players and they won't understand it. Because as you get older, and again, I talk about this on coach education all the time, as you get older, a lot of your education is more direct. The lecturer or the teacher stands at the front and they tell you. So you then you then start to become programmed to to understand that more. At primary school, it's not taught that way. Why? Because again, the teachers know how the kids learn at different ages and different stages. And I think as tennis coaches, we need to have an awareness of this. So which is best? A mixture of both going forwards. But I think with under eight, you definitely have to be more game based or or constraint based. If you're too direct, it's just overload, I believe, in my opinion. If you've done it that way, it's worked for you. Absolutely amazing. You're again, great coaching. I think sometimes I have have conversations around this all the time. It's if you can get them there using that model, absolutely perfect. Again, I'm not here to preach. I'm just here to give my opinion um, and just share with what what's worked for me. It might work for me. It might not work for you. That's the art of of coaching. That's the art of life. We all have our different journeys and different pathways. So, how do we actually use this constraint based model? So we have the coach in the middle. So constraints mean just manipulating or modifying three main things. We can we can manipulate and modify the situation. We can manipulate and modify the game. And we can manipulate and modify the player. The situation may also be called the environment, by the way, so the court. The game is, is the rules or the task. And the player, well, the player is the player. So your job as a coach is you're constantly analyzing these three things. And what you have to do is is change one or maybe two of these things to get the desired outcome that you want. And we're going to look at that in greater detail now. So let's look at each one, the player. So what can we change with a player? So a few things we have to take into consideration is the psychological factors. So players' maturity, behavior, motivations, and emotions must be, must be considered. So we talked about this quite a lot. We're quite limited at this level in terms of what the player can do. So we have to take that into consideration. So when we manipulate things, we can't make them too complex. We have to give them some guidance. We have to give them some focus. Um, we also have to, and I say this all the time, my job is to guide the player, not to tell the player. Um, but we have to take into consideration the, the psychological factors. We've got to take into consideration the physical developments or attributes, weight, height, fitness levels, muscles, or genetic makeup. So, we, so again, coaches say, oh, but but we can improve these things. 
using my gym gym analogy before, what we see the players 45 minutes a week, we may spend five minutes doing physical development. We're not going to improve those things. Very difficult to improve those things in five minutes. And then we also can manipulate and develop the tennis and sport and skill levels. So tactics and and sort of technique, which we've, we've uh, which we've talked about and covered. You've got to understand that we have very limited control over manipulating the player. Very difficult for us to change the way they think. Very difficult. We can help. We can give them cues and give them uh, checkpoints and guidelines and advice. But at the end of the day, the player will make their own mind up. Very difficult for us to develop their physical skills as coaches. Again, that has to come down to the player. And like I said before, we may spend 10 minutes a week doing lower body strength work. Is it really going to make a huge difference? No. What we can do is show the player how to develop those skills and they may take it off on their own and do homework and then and then sort of they develop it. Can we develop their tennis and sport and skills? We can help. But again, ultimately comes down to the player. And this is the most important one. I think we need to understand it's it's the player's tennis. Like it's not our tennis. We may we may want Steve to be an aggressive baseliner, but I might want to be a serve volleyer. And you only have to listen to a lot of podcasts of former players, especially British players. Uh, if you listen to like uh, Control the Controllables, uh, the Mark Willis one, uh, the the Willis one. A lot of ex-players say, oh, I was doing really well till I went to ex-coach and ex-coach tried to change my game and, I, and it ruined me. And it, it ruined him because the coach tried to change the player. It's the one that we have the least control over, but we have some input. We can help. We can advise and guide the player, but we need to understand that we can't completely control the player, but we need an awareness and we need to make sure our expectations are right as well. And we need to take into consideration the physical and mental uh, capabilities of our player based on the aging stage. And we have to understand that every player is different. If you have a group of 12, you've got 12 individuals. What works for me might not work for Andy Murray. What works for Andy Murray definitely doesn't work for me. Um, so you've got two different, different personalities, two different physical makeups. So if you're trying to teach me and Andy the same forehand... You're wasting your time because it's different. It's going to be different. That's why every player in the world hits the ball differently. Medvedev, compare him to Djokovic, completely different. Different personalities, different body shapes, different mentalities. We can't keep teaching a model-based coaching. We really can't. And years ago, again, I put my hand up. I, I taught the forehand. I don't teach forehand no more. I teach many forehands in many different situations, um, but some players will have different types of forehand than others. I'm not going to tell you how to do this C shape or or how to do all these model based work because it might not work for you. It really might not. The task, the task is the one that we can manipulate quite well. So the task is the games and the drills and activities we set up. This is the one we have the most control over. Because we will set up generally the lesson plan. Yeah. And it's really more about the information we give the players during the sessions. As a coach, we have the opportunity to manipulate the task or the game or the drill to get the movement, the technique that we want. And we can manipulate the, 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 the task to get what we want. And that's what constraint-based coaching is about. It's about looking at what you want and how can you manipulate the task or the activity or the game to get the outcome and to get it without directly telling the player, getting the player to feel it themselves. And we can do it by changing space, the rules, equipment, and rotating players. So those of you who are coaches, differentiation, we just change it and modify it to get the outcome that we want. And our job is to guide the player on that journey. And when we do modify it, we're not telling them how to do it straight away. And you'll uh, see it in a few minutes in the clips. Yeah, we're, we're trying to get the player to learn it themselves. And you may say, well, if I'm a direct coach, I can do it that way as well. You can. But the difference between the, the, the method that I'll show you in a minute and direct coaching is 
is how is how we get that information across. And last but not least, before we get on some videos, I do promise I do have some videos, is the environment. So we also we always think of the environment as the core. True. Yeah, it might be the core, it's, it's surroundings, uh, the equipment you use. But to me, the environment is the culture. It's the culture in which you set. If you're a very direct, heavy coach and tell, 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 that's the environment you're setting. I'm the boss. You're the player. You listen to me. I know best because I'm the coach. I've done this for 20 odd years. I've produced X amount of players. I've played at Wimbledon. I know what I'm talking about. You listen to me. That's culture. That's a direct culture. My culture, my your coaching is about you. You're in control. You're the boss. I ask you questions. You ask me questions. I listen to you more than you listen to me. And we'll work it out together. So the environment is something that we really can control. And it's not so much about the court. It's more about what you set up, how you bring the players in. Do, do, do you allow your players to throw rackets? Do you allow your players to talk when you're talking? Do, do you allow your players to um, pick their partners and only work with their friends and stuff? Stuff like that is culture. And don't forget, we need to really think about how our culture impacts players. And there's a few questions on here, which I'm not going to read out to you. I would like you to reflect on these and think about, okay, how do I actually set up my culture? What is my culture at my club? Do you actually know what your culture is? Like, what are your values? What, what, what really do you bring out? For me, teamwork, respect, accountability, responsibility. Like, I never put my kids into groups. Okay, groups are free, go. And you're standing there looking at me. No, accountability, responsibility, make make decisions, work with each other. Group of three, but different partners, go. I'm not going to go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I want it to be independent. My players set courts up. They set the nets up. They, they, they put the equipment out. They set targets, independence. That's the culture that I, that I create. And that has a massive impact on learning and development. We also have to think about external factors, parents, peers, governing bodies. If their values and culture don't meet yours or match yours, then you're in trouble. And there's an interesting conversation on an LTA performance um, workshop two weeks ago about parents being on court and some coaches saying, well, I don't want parents on court, nightmare. Don't want them listening in. They get involved and, and sort of um, they put lots of pressure on and stuff. The issue with that is, if you separate the parents from the player, when the player goes off the court, the parents will be hitting them with lots of information. Bang, bang, bang. I seen this. Duh, 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 duh. If the, if the parents involved in it, been involved in the culture and they're sitting on the court side and they see what your values are and the culture you're setting and you have conversations with the parent about culture and how you how you teach the player and what you want the player to do in terms of being independent and making mistakes and stuff, then it works much better. And a lot of the stuff we can we can set up drills. We can set up drills all day long. But if the culture, if the environment's not right, does it really develop learning? And this is an area I think we need to understand and develop better as coaches in terms of culture. Um and at the minute I'm sort of reading a lot on emotional intelligence. I really sort of recommend that if you're a coach and you really like this type of stuff, look into that as well. And what type of learning environment do you set up and encourage and support? And how much does your learning environment and how you how you approach coaching, does it facilitate learning or does it hinder? Is your style, is your culture, is your environment actually doing more harm than good? Again, lessons to reflect on. And these are the lessons, sorry, these are the reflections I come away with every night. Did I set the right environment tonight? Did I communicate in a way that developed learning? And sometimes I come off and say, no, I set the wrong environment. It was the wrong tone tonight. The way I came across probably didn't help. And it's it's just it's just being human. Sometimes we 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 don't get it right, but we have to think about it. Right. So now to the good stuff. 
So we're going to look at a couple of clips, and these are real-life clips. Let me give you a little background to the player. So I've been working with the player since Feb this year, so, what, eight months? When I first started working with the player, who is so with six now, they were five when I started working with them. Um, very competitive, hates hates losing with a passion. I mentioned before, if he makes a single mistake, his head drops and he gets very angry. Um, he also has a tendency to feel like he needs to make excuses. So he'll make a mistake. And I can't remember if it's, if it's in the clips here or not. Um, that a lot of the time, oh, I didn't understand. Oh, I get it now. Oh, and a lot of that is he's he's scared. He's scared in case I start having to go with him, and which 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 is ne which is never the case. Um, I think part of it because he's super competitive. Um, when I first started working for him, he had no backhand, couldn't serve, pretty good at the forehand. Um, and in the session which I'm going to show you, and you see on the screen, uh, so the task is simple. I say simple, nothing's ever simple in tennis. Split the court into two. You got red side on the right, blue side on the left. We're in a cross court battle. So we're going forehand to forehand, red to red. He can change direction at any point. So he's the controller. I'm just the reactor. I can only hit the ball back to him cross court. He's in control of the rally. At any point, he's going to change direction. And what he's done down the far end is he's put a cone out. And he set that cone himself, and, and he said he wants to get the ball between the cone and the outside line to make it difficult for his opponent to run to. So quite smart, to be fair. He, he, he didn't put the cone right in the middle. He understands that he's got to make me move from that corner to the other corner, so it's a, a harder shot. Um, so what am I looking for in, in, in sort of when, when we start this? So when I first demo it, and unfortunately, there's no there's no audio. Well, there is audio, but you can't hear because there's lots of lessons going on around me. And um, even if I was mic'd up, you just get lots of background information, um, which which is not ideal. So I I basically said to him, okay, we're going to rally cross court, red to red. You're the controller. I want you to change direction. Once you change direction, we play the point out. And that's all the information you give to him, red to red. But when you go to blue, we can play the point out. And what I'm looking for is when does he change direction? And how so go go back to the girl before funny enough which which nicely ties in um i want him to be able to change direction of the ball tactically so i don't want him just to be grinding the ball cross court cross court cross court i want him to when he gets the opportunity change direction and he's and this is the first couple of points so he's going to go red to red and he, he's so interesting, like most players, he changes straight away. And he goes again. And this happened quite a few times. So he, he was literally changing on the second ball. Which is fine. Like, I'm not saying he has to rally 10 shots and then go line. He has the opportunity. And to be fair, I am hitting the ball a little bit short. So I'm happy that he's changing. Um... And what I observed was he was changing, but he was jamming up. So I like the fact he was changing direction, but was it was it effective? No, because he was he was just tapping the ball over the net. So I intervened. So it's just my first intervention. And unfortunately, you can't hear it because I'm not mic'd up. So I got him in and I said, I, uh, I said, listen, really well done. Really well done. I love the fact he changed direction. And I love the fact you've been so brave and you're changing direction so early. Um, why, why are you changing on those? And he said, oh, I'm changing it because you're out wide. I know, that's, pre that's pretty good. Yeah, for a red court, if you get me wide, great opportunity to change direction. Um, he said, oh, I'm also changing it because 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 it, it's short. Again, that I think is stuff that he's been coached. I don't think he actually understands short and deep. Um, so I was a little bit, oh, okay. Um, but fine. But I said, okay, but when you're changing direction, do you want the ball to land before the cone or after the cone? And, and, he, and he had a good thing. So I, I wanted to go after the cone. Okay, good. Why? Because it'll take time and space away from you. Again, I think a little bit of what we've been working on quite a lot in lessons. So 
normally he'll say to me time and space when I ask him a question um, just because again he thinks that programming he's been he's, he's been told about time and space so much that that's his go-to answer for most things and what's you have for dinner time and space <laughs> not, not quite um, so I said okay well if you go short is that going to make it easy or difficult for me he said easy okay so what so how can you keep hitting the ball like 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 a drop shot how can we just keep tapping it over and interestingly and 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 this shows how 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 clever he is and i mean this shows our relationship to the point where it's at now he, he said i'm scared i'm scared why why are you scared i'm scared of missing i'm scared of missing so i'm playing safe oh, okay okay i love that i i i love your honesty what I want you to do is is play without fear. Okay, play 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 without fear. I really want you to hit through the ball. Yeah, and just go for your shot. It's it's practice. It's practice. If you hit ten and you get six in and you miss four, then that's an amazing result. If you get one out of ten, that's one today, and we'll do it again next week. We'll get two out of ten. That's progress. That's an amazing result. There's no pressure on you here. Play without fear. And this is what I'm sort of saying to him here is just loosen up. Just just, just go for your shot. So what I've not done is I've not directly told him how to change his technique. Old me, 10, 15 years ago, would have went in and said, okay, you've got to go through the ball more. Okay, push your racket through the ball. Hit through the ball. Yeah, rack it back early, longer swing, hit through the ball. Direct coaching. I've not even talked about technique. I've talked more about him here because it's not a technical issue. <laughs> it's a it's a, it's a head or heart issue. It's the it's a performance issue. So I've 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 tried to take the shackles off his fear by saying it, it doesn't matter. Like just just go for it. If you get one out of ten, I'm proud of you. I'm really happy with you. The next week you get two, I'll be even more happy to, about you. So I've so I've I've try to take the shackles of him, and let's see what happens. So we're having a good in in depth conversation, down at his level, talking to him, asking questions again. I will I will do a presentation with me mic'd up, um, so you can actually see how I communicate and talk. So we so we go again. So will I see anything different here? And this is what I mean about. Tennis looking messy. Like he misses the first ball. He misses the second ball. He misses the third ball. Now, how many coaches just jump straight in and start teaching now? Oh, you know what? Here's a basket. I'll I'll uh, throw you some. I'll throw you some. Structure, regimented. I'll take control. I'm not saying that I'm perfect, but I'm down the far end. Chilled. Just nice and chilled. Get another one. Another go. I'm allowing him to feel it. He'll work it out. I'm just giving him time and space. I'm not putting any pressure on him. Come on, get that ball in. Why are you missing that first ball? Get that ball in. You've got to get that ball in. I'm not. I'm like, okay, mate. Let's go again. No worries. Go again, mate. Fine. Let's go again. Because if I start shouting at him and giving him lots of direct instruction, adding stress and pressure to him, it's making it worse. I'm chilled down the far end. But again, I understand why a lot of coaches start panicking here. Oh my God, the parents are watching me. They're going to think this is rubbish. They they, they don't think I, I, I know what I'm doing. Not me, man. Chilled. Have a little check. The parents are watching. Okay, now we're going. So he gets it in. Gets me wide. Big long swing right into the corner. Straight away. First point. I get what I want and I stop the drill. That's what I want, mate. I want to hit through that ball. I want to be confident and go through it. Proud of you. That word proud is so powerful. Because that's all the kids want. They want they want you, the coach, to take an interest in them. They want you to be proud of them. They want the parents to be proud of them. 
I say it all the time. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of how hard you're working. I'm proud of what you're doing. I'm so happy to be working with you. It's not lies. I am proud. Like that's a hard shot. He's he's literally gone down the line. He's hit the corner of the court, and he's done it after making two mistakes, three mistakes. So he's missed three balls in a row. Yeah, and he's done that straight away. Proud of you. Bang straight on. Did I look at all the stuff that went wrong? No. Ten years ago, would I? Yeah, hundred percent. He definitely would have been getting basket fed a hundred balls there. Yeah, and then and then we re, and then we repeated that a few times, okay. But I wasn't quite getting the result I wanted. So what was happening was he was changing direction, but he was changing direction with really high ball. So he was going really high, um, and and the problem was he was just giving me too much time. So even though he was changing direction, which was great, which is what which, which is what I wanted, it was it was too easy for me. So I wanted him to go a little bit lower. And a little bit flatter with his technique. Okay, so now I'm thinking about the game. Yeah. So what I did, you might be able to see on the screen, is I've literally placed up some barrier tape over the top. So now he has an option. He can go over the tape if he wants, or he can go under the tape. And what I want him to do, which I haven't told him, by the way, I want him to go cross cut over. And then when he changed direction, I want him to go lower than flat and go under. That's what I want, because that's how I want him to play. Trade cross, create the space, get the opportunity, go flat and go down the line. I haven't told him that, but I've just set up the court. So I'm constraining the task here. I put something up to give him something to think about. This is quite a long clip. I think it's about three minutes. So this so is the first few points. So again... I've told him, and the great thing here, which I absolutely love, he's asking me questions. He's asking me about, okay, what, what? I can go lower. I don't have to always go high. Oh, okay. I love that because that shows to me he's starting to process it. He's starting to think about what I've set him. He's now thinking for himself. I've just given the options. This is what you can do. You rally cross court to red. You change direction to blue, but now you've got the choice. You can either go over the tape or under the tape. Choice is yours. Let's play. Let's see. And so he's he, he's he's asking me here. He's trying to work it out. I love it. Again, not getting frustrated. I'm letting him speak. I'm letting him talk. I'm listening more. Feed the ball in. We play the point out. So he goes over straight away. So he's got something physical he can see now. And now he changed direction and notice he goes over. And I win the point. I win it on purpose. And I'm saying to him, oh, thanks. You went over the tape. And, I, and, and what I'm saying to him is, oh, you gave me lots of time. That was so good. I loved it when you give me time there. And I'm saying that stuff to him because I want him to think, oh, I don't want to give him time. If I give him time, that's what's going to happen to me. So I'm not telling him. I'm almost commentating. Okay, Adam goes high over the over the tape. Steve's got lots of time. Steve's got so much time he can smack the ball and win the point. Yeah. I'm commentating. I'm bringing awareness to what's happening. I'm not telling him. I want him to work it out himself. And you can see you can see the little clogs turning. So now he goes under straight away. He goes over it again. Steve's got lots of time. Big back and into the corner. Come on, vamos. And again, explaining to him. I had so much time. I could move. I could set up and play. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Not telling him. Now let's see what happens. So we're two points in. He goes under again, which is interesting. Then he goes over. Oh, okay. You could see there that he was trying to go under, but he just didn't quite make it. Now he goes over high. Now he goes high again. He plays it safe. And again, I think he plays it safe because he missed the, the, the one before. The one before, he's tried to go really low and quick, and he hasn't judged it properly. So he's missed. So the next point... He's, he's he's reverted back to, I'll go safe. I'll go safe and go over. 
But he's gone safe and gone over, and he's been punished. And this is what I'm saying to him here. All right, easy. Had loads of time now. How can you make this more difficult for me? Okay, he's gone over. Oh, okay, now he's starting to go lower. He So he went straight away lower. He's starting to work it out. He's gone higher. Short ball. He's gone lower and he gets a net cord. And look at the celebration. Okay, he's now worked it out. So this has taken, what, three, four minutes? And you could see the first couple playing it safe. He's just keeping it normal. Keeps losing the point. Every time he goes higher, I'm making him <laughs> making him suffer. But I'm making him lose. I'm winning the point. I'm making him lose the point. And then we're talking about it. Last couple, he started to go lower. He hit the net in the first one. Got a net cord on the second one. But he's now clocked it. He's now clocked what he needs to change. So he, he goes lower straight away. Because, again, without knowing, without getting inside his head, I think in his head now he's thinking, if I go lower, it's going to make it more hard. It's going to make it more difficult. But he's realized that he can't go too low. So he goes high. Goes high again. He pushes me wide. Then he goes low down the line and deep. And I miss on purpose. And then, yeah, that's it. That's it. And then he did that three or four more times. And I was made up. Because if, if you compare that to the start of the session, where he was just tapping it when he was changing direction, by manipulating the situation, by manipulating the game, he's changed. He's changed how he's hitting the ball. He's hitting lower. He's hitting flatter. And is it is it perfect? Absolutely not. In a few weeks' time, will it be better? Absolutely. In six months' time, will it be even better? Absolutely. He's going to get bigger. He's going to get stronger. And all I'm doing is putting those little building blocks in place. But how I present this to him is, is key. It, it, it's so laid back. It's... Maybe sometimes too laid back, you may say, but it, it's loose. I'm I'm guiding him towards the answers. I want him to work out himself. But I'm I'm manipulating the situation. I'm constraining the activity. By putting that tape up, it's giving him something visual. Visual learners, which we talked about way back at the start of this presentation. Kinesthetic, he can feel the difference from going higher, from going lower. Decision making, he decides when to change direction. Tactically relevant? Absolutely. Yeah, he's trying to make me move. He's controlling space. Technical, uh, technically, what's he working on? He's working on changing the racket face, the path, the angle, the speed of the ball. Is it absolutely perfect? At a massive high level? No. But we'll get there. It will take time. Could I do this drill with a basket drill and make him look really good? Absolutely. And some of you watchers think, oh, yeah, but hang on. He's quite good, that kid. He's all right. He's he's obviously played a lot of tennis. He's he's good. My kids can't even do that. You can do this game doing um, floor tennis. Take the net out the way. If I get my little pointer, you could push the ball red to red, and the player again can change direction, and the floor rally. You can do it throwing and catching. You can do it. You can do it and modify it any way you want. I'm really. It bugs me. I'm being absolutely honest. It bugs me when coaches go, "Oh, my players aren't that good." Well, then change the game, modify it, change the equipment, change the space, change change the equipment. You can do this on, on the floor and it's still tactically and technically relevant. That's good coaching. A bad coach will just restrict it and get them queuing up and I'll throw you a ball. Okay, next one red, next one blue, next one red. It's too It's too controlled and regimented. It's it's given them the opportunity to explore and develop their skill set on their own. We are running out of time. I did say this was going to be close to, to 90 minutes. I've got eight minutes or so left. So key takeaways for you in terms of how I teach, how I teach this constraint-led approach. 
again, it might not be for you. You might be happy doing your basket feeding and your and your direct coaching, and you may produce lots of players. And hats off to you, because I sometimes I don't think it's so much the approach, but the relationship that you have with the player. Yeah, if you've got a really good relationship with the player, that direct approach can work as well. It, it said to me, this is this is how I find coaching fun. To me, from 20 years experience doing both approaches, I've done both. I've been that direct coach, that basket fed coach. I've done this coach. I I feel my players enjoy it more. I get less stressed. I enjoy it more. Um, and I'm finding now that my players are better competitors. 100%. I think the next batch of players I produce are going to be my best ever because I think I've learned so much more and my approach is, has changed. Um, but what are the key lessons? So there's, two, so there's two ways of doing this. There's the constraint-based coaching and there's direct coaching. If you're going to go constraint coached, players have to learn to rally, attack, and defend together. And, and if you if you think about the player in, in, in that video, yeah, he's rallying cross-court and he's attacking down the line. So he's, he's working in two different situations. There may be times where I hit the ball deep against him. He's got to defend. He's not just learning how to hit a forehand. Even though it was a forehand lesson. So he he's doing forehands in that lesson. Yeah. But I'm not teaching him how to hit a forehand. Not once I tell him how to hold the racket, how to move the racket. And he has to get his body in that shape. Yeah. I'm letting him develop the movement himself. Obviously, if it's massively extreme, then I'll constrain it a different way. I'll change it. But at, but, at, but at that moment, like, he, he didn't need to. Um, he's learning to adapt to various t- type of shots. Again, he's he's hitting forehands there, but he's hitting lots of different forehands. Some forehands are high, some forehands are low, some forehands are short, some forehands are deep. He's central, he, he's central, he's out wide. He's adapting to hit that forehand in different areas. He's making decisions. He decides when to change direction. He's in control. And I say this all the time. You're, you're, you're the controller. Pardon me, I'm I'm the reactor. He's in control of the rally. He's being proactive. And he's playing tennis. He's playing the game. Yeah, that's the game of tennis. And the next drill, which we did after that, we did the same game with serve and return. So serve, go under over the tape with the serve, up to you. And then sort of play the point out. And that's different than the direct coaching. It wasn't just how to hit a forehand. I didn't tell him what he can't do. Yeah. So when he made those three mistakes, I didn't jump straight in and say, no, what are you doing? You've got to do this. Stop missing. Stop making mistakes. I ignored what he can't do. When he did it, I stopped it. Yes, that's it. Because, and I reinforced. I didn't ask him to hit perfect shots. Don't be perfect. Yeah. Adapt and change. He had lots of input in that session. And again, I, 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 there will be a future webinar where it'll just be me on court with the player and I'll, and I'll, and I'll wear the mic and you can see how little I talk. Or if I am talking, I'm asking questions. I'm asking questions. I'm getting their opinion and getting their input. I want them to think for themselves. I also want them to share their ideas because he may feel that he wants to go line on a very deep ball. and He, he may make it all the time because he might have great hands. Who am I to say he can't do that? It's 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 his tennis. And we said this before, direct coaching, very difficult to perform under pressure because you will feed the perfect ball. You will make them feel good. You'll make them look good. And that's the difference. <laughs> they, and I've said it a few times in this presentation, a good coach will use both. Yeah, they'll push, they'll pull. They'll use constraint-based stuff. They'll direct when they need to direct. And sometimes you've got to be a bit more direct and you will find yourself transitioning out the two. For me, it's probably an 80-20 split. 80% of the time I'm constraint-based. 20% of the time I might be a bit more direct. Um, Just try it. Try it out and see how it feels. And I think and I believe that constraint-based coaching is, is a lot more difficult. Because you've got to be patient. You've got to know what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. And that's tough. 
direct coaching is dead easy. Just go in, bang, 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 bang. Information, 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 information. And and you'll and if you go to your club or or centre to, tonight or or this week, listen to the coaching. Load to high. Turn your shoulders. Turn your shoulders. Turn your shoulders. Turn your shoulders. Bam, 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 bam. Just direct information. Dead easy. Yeah, there's there's some coaches I worked with. You could probably record one lesson and then play it for the next six, and it'll be the same information being played for the six lessons. Just to set like like on a loop. Turn, turn, turn. <laughs> um constraint based coaching is tougher because you're you're constantly analyzing and you're constantly thinking about what to say. And sometimes I ask the one question, sometimes I frame it the wrong way. And that's part of my learning process as well. And it, it makes it challenging for me because I don't go in there with a script because you don't know what's in front of you. They may have a great day and they're so engaged. Last night with the same play, I turned up and he was he was tired and he had a bad day at school and it was a lot tougher because I had to really change the way I approached it a little bit in terms of the the learning and 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 and, and the talking and the question and answering. But I'm going to leave you with two final things, and these are sort of two things. These are my two philosophies at the moment, which I'm really into. And if you are on Instagram at my tennis coaching, you probably would have seen these over the last couple of months. Technique. On its own, is just a movement. That's all technique is. Technique is a movement. You move your hand from A to B. You move the racket from A to B. Technique plus pressure equals skill. And that's what we're, we're developing tennis skills. We're not developing perfect technique. We are developing tennis skills. And we need to develop those skills under pressure. And that's the key to constraint-based coaching. It's getting them to develop those skills under pressure. And guess what? When they go and play matches, they'll be able to replicate that skill. Um, there's, there's a great conversation I had with a coach the other week, and they were saying, oh, all my best players are the ones who compete, so I need to get everyone to compete. I said, great. Yeah, competition, all for it. But I said, but why do you think they're your best players? He said, because they're competing, so so they can play under pressure. I said, yeah, True. But have they developed their skills in your training session or in that comp or in that competitive environment? Oh, in my training session? I said, probably not. They developed those skills in the competitive environment under pressure. And that's why they're so good. Because they've gone to a tournament and they've adapted to the to the environment, to the task, to the opponent, to themselves. They've adapted and under pressure. And they've done it so many times. They played so many tournaments. That's why they're your best player. They're not your best player because they come eight sessions a week. And you and, and people watching this presentation now, you have a player in your program who trains all the time but never plays. And they're really good. They're really good in drills. Put them in a match situation, they fall apart. Why? Because they've learned in isolation. They've learned without the pressure. And this is this is my thing that I really think about every day is the game is the teacher. I'm not the teacher. I'm the coach. Tennis is the teacher. Yeah, tennis will teach them everything they need to know about the game. 25, 30 years ago, I didn't have a tennis coach. How did I learn how to play tennis? Oh, I play tennis. I just played with my mates. We set up US Opens, Wimbledon tournaments. We played lots of matches. We found ways to beat each other. The game taught us how to play. Didn't have a coach. Uncoached. The court's a learning environment. Goes back to what we were saying before. How we set the court up in terms of how we present information. Yeah, that's that that that's a learning environment. Our job is just to facilitate. It's to bring it all together, bring the player, the environment, the task together, and we just help the player on that journey. Our job is not to tell them how to play the game. Our job is to help them play the game. And we do that by sort of guiding them with our information and our knowledge and our experience by using the environment and letting them play, play tennis. Okay, so hopefully we are just over 90 minutes. So that I've served me two couple more minutes. So hopefully we've got a better understanding of the under eight opportunities and challenges. 
we've had a look at direct coaching and constraint led coaching and we've understand the basics of the constraint led approach and we've had a little look at some real life examples which is i think is always good and always powerful um in terms of things next i've got some really exciting things so please stick around me for 90 more seconds i promise this can be worth your while in january 2023 i have a book coming out so i've got 50 constraint led games for under eight players that you can use in your groups it's really good if you've been on my instagram over the last few weeks if you're on my email list you would have seen some great examples really fun games that you can play in a group environment that will teach the game without you even teaching 50 of them 50 of my best games um i'm literally putting them all together now it's going to be hopefully finished in mid-january um if you go onto my website there are a couple of links you have a little look at it Really excited to say in April 2023, I'm going to be doing coach workshops on this. So following on from the book launch, I will be going around some clubs and developing, uh, delivering coach education workshops. So if you are really interested in this constraint-led approach, if you if you think, yeah, I'd like to see more of that in action, um, I will be doing some coach education workshops. If you currently work at a venue or you own a venue and you'd like to host one of those workshops, Give me a shout, Steve at mytenniscoaching.com. Um, so Steve at mytenniscoaching.com. Um, I'm open for ideas. I can come to your club. I can train your coaches. We can sort of have a have a look at it and break it down and share knowledge. That's what I love about coach education. But I'm plans to do that in April 20, uh, April to September next year. I will get some information out over the next couple of weeks. If you want information about the book or the workshops, please subscribe to my uh, website, mytenniscoaching.com. If you go onto the blog section, there's a little box at the top. Put your email in there. Uh, I send an email out every Tuesday with just lots of tips, basically. Uh, lots of tips, lots of advice. Um, so if you do want more information, that's the place to go. Please follow me on social media. I tend to post once, twice, maybe three times a day on all the different platforms at My Tennis Coaching. Please give me a follow. Um, and that's about it. Listen, I hope you've enjoyed it. My throat is killing me. Sorry I couldn't answer um, the questions live. I got into a, into a run. I will go through any that have come through. If you didn't want to leave a question but want to get in touch with me, please email me, steve at mytenniscoaching.com. I'll get back to you. There's no there's no team behind this. It's just me. Um, as I always say, you may like this way of coaching. You may not like it. Hopefully, you got some type of value from it. Have a great week. I will be doing a live next week again. I've not quite got a subject, um, but I'll let you know through social media at my tennis coach.